Good afternoon and welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister here in Washington, D.C. These are your headlines. For April 10th, 2012, U.S. President Barack Obama makes the case in Florida for the Buffett rule, a minimum tax rate for millionaires. Take a look. Warren Buffett is paying a lower tax rate than his secretary. Now that's wrong. That's not fair. Well, then he reportedly heads to a $15,000 a head campaign fundraiser. So how does that work exactly? The presumably wealthy people paying 15 grand for dinner with Obama are giving him money for him to raise their taxes? What do they think's in it for them? We'll talk about how the political process really works when it comes to the money being thrown around. And here to do it. Excuse me. Yes. This is Agent Patterson with the FBI. Yeah, I have to call you back. Mr. President. Well, that's the Casino Jack movie version of his story. In real life, he's former super lobbyist Jack Abramoff. He pleaded guilty to lobbying-related crimes, did the time. Now he's exposing the secrets of how special interests get their way in Washington. We'll get an inside look. Also, we'll look at how to be a crook. Instead of just printing money and buying stuff with it, you print money and loan it to other people. It's that simple. We'll talk about it. Let's get to today's capital account. So when it comes to lobbying and special interests in Washington, we talk a lot about Wall Street and the financial sector and their purported influence. And now, of course, one of the facts to support that is the lobbying dollars they spend. So the finance, along with real estate and insurance sector, ranks third in the amount of lobbying dollars spent over the last 13 years, so more than $4.8 billion. You can see there, that's after health and then miscellaneous business. Now, one might deduce that it's paying off because look at how much more banks are spending is one example. This is commercial banks, and they spent $60 million in 2011. It's been going up. Now, the biggest spenders for 2011, the American Bankers Association, and a lot of names you know well, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, also on that list up there is Bank of America. And take a look at hedge funds. They've really increased their spending a lot, too. And also private equity, which is obviously attracting new heat these days. If we could move that forward. Oh, you see it there. With Mitt Romney is the Republican frontrunner and his Bain background getting a lot of attention. So it remains to be seen <laughs> what that number will look like for 2012. Now, the biggie for finance recently, post-financial crisis, seems to really have been Dodd-Frank regulation and more recently the Volcker rule portion of it, which we've been talking a lot about. Now, we see the facts and figures, but how exactly do special interests influence Washington? How does it work? work. Well, we're lucky because today we have an insider here to tell us. Our guest was the Republican super lobbyist. Kevin Spacey played him in the movie version, Casino Jack, we played a bit of. He was convicted on charges of fraud, corruption, and conspiracy related to his illegal lobbying efforts back in 2006. He did the time. He was released in 2010 and has been speaking out against lobbying since then, working to reform the system. Jack Abramoff is here. He's former lobbyist, as I said, also author of Capital Punishment, The Hard Truth About Washington Corruption from America's Most Notorious Lobbyist. So thank you so much for being on the show first. Thanks for having me. I think our viewers are going to be really excited to hear how this all really works from someone who's experienced it um, firsthand. So you have called lobbying legalized bribery. I've heard you say that a number of times. Um, in what ways are these methods, the legal methods, used to lobby uh, a special interest cause? Well, well, I should note that not all lobbying is bribery, not all lobbying is bad. And our lobbying is guaranteed by our Constitution to petition our government. Where fair money, enough. sorry? <laughs> I said fair enough. <laughs> yes, well, where, where money comes into play, though, where lobbyists use resources and money and their clients use it to tilt the playing field, that's where the bribery comes in and that's where the corruption comes in. And that, frankly, if you look at some of the successful sectors, uh, we're going to talk about the banking sector and other 
others like that or labor unions. That's where the money comes into play in the campaigns and how they deal with congressmen and things like that. And that's the corruption. Well, give me an example of, of what you would consider legalized bribery. Well, any time, I didn't hold this way, by the way, when I was a lobbyist. Uh, obviously, I had a different uh, view of the matter. But uh, any time, yes, yes, well, uh, <laughs> Would never nothing like a two by four to the head to uh, get your attention as it was with me. But um, basically, any time somebody who's trying to get something back from the federal government gives something, uh, a donation, a meal, golf, tickets to a ball game, to a public servant with the intent of getting that public servant to do something for them, it's a bribe. If we did that with a judge, everybody would get it immediately. It's a bribe. These people basically in our system are judges. They're making judgments on behalf of the American people and giving them things or raising money for them. That, that's bribes. Well, that's an interesting part of it. Talk about the raising money that lobbyists do for politicians. And what I thought was interesting that I heard you say was it's the politicians expect that if they're going to do something in the cases that you give. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, the lobbyists, the way the lobbyists gets in there the most is by raising money. These, these folks, uh, if you look at the congressional races, and certainly the Senate races, they cost tens of millions of dollars. They have to spend their time raising money all the time. The people who have the incentive to get their money are people who want something back from them. Until we get to a system where all of those people are excluded, we're going to have a corrupt system. And that, unfortunately, uh, is what we have. And Congress understands the game. They understand that if somebody gives them money, that they have to at least be attentive to their needs, not necessarily do everything they want. But uh, being attentive, that is where the corruption actually enters the process. How much money? I'm just, you know, what is a figure that's a significant enough figure to where someone is going to feel responsible to do something for, for a lobbyist? Well, I hold, by the way, that any amount gets them going. Because if you're a normal human being, if somebody does something for you, something nice for you, buys you something, gives you something, deep down at least you're going to feel gratitude. You may be a jerk and don't feel gratitude, but that's unlikely that somebody like that is going to wind up. I don't going know. To Politicians? Office. Well, maybe they're, deep they're down they're jerks, but they certainly don't act like jerks, <laughs> uh, at least to the public. And and they're going to feel gratitude. And the moment that gratitude enters the process, it's not a question of how much. Frankly, ten dollars does it. Anything that's good starts the process, and that's why we have to cut off all money uh, from lobbyists and their clients to uh, to public officials. If ten dollars was was good enough, why wouldn't some of these maybe? people that are trying to reform the banking system be more successful than the J.P. Morgans of the world that are spending a lot of money. Well, I mean, the, exactly. I mean, the people who are spending a lot of money are getting all the more. Uh, it's not the $10 everybody's equal if you give $10, $10 or $10 million. I guess what I'm saying is once the process starts, once the gratitude starts, there's a problem. And it's something that we don't want in our public servants. And unfortunately, it's something we see virtually entirely through the, the whole system. Yeah, I mean, I'm with you there. I want you to talk some specifics, because you've been writing recently about uh, one of your clients that was Tyco in the past and how you convinced members of Congress not to impose a retroactive tax on inverted companies. So these are companies that reincorporate overseas. Uh, usually, it's to avoid paying U.S. corporate taxes. Right. Tax havens and, and moving money overseas is something we hear a lot about with corporations. So how did you go about doing that? What's the tack there? Well, um, Tyco came to me. They were basically far down the road of being in trouble. The, the Senate had already put them into their bill. The House was about to do it. And they had been failed by other lobbying firms. And the tack I took was uh, that I organized the companies. Tyco is, a, uh, is basically a conglomerate of about 350 companies. And I took all the vendors of all the companies, the heads of all these vendors, and organized them to call the senators and the congressmen so as to say to them, listen, we're your donors, we're your friends, we're your neighbors, what are you doing? You're killing the goose that laid the golden egg, basically. You're interfering in business in a way that's unfair. They actually were proposing to put a retroactive tax to the tune of about $4.8 billion on Tyco that would have wiped them out and basically wiped out all these vendors as well. You sound like a lobbyist now. I used to be. <laughs> it's hard to get it out of the system. Okay, so that's but that's an example of a common tactic to to rally the troops to to oppose it. Yes, I, I think we've seen more and more over the last decade uh, that uh, lobbyists realize they can't just do everything inside the beltway. They've got to go outside the beltway. They've got to go into the districts and into the states. And and this is one of the dangers, by the way, with the Decision Assistance United and super PACs that lobbyists can marshal unlimited funds if they're good at what they do and have dramatic impact in some of the races out there, and that's, uh, I think, it's something we certainly did and something we see a lot of now. So you think that's going on now and yeah, is, is worse than when you were a lobbyist, possibly? I, I don't know if it was worse. It was pretty bad when I was a lobbyist. It was pretty bad by what we did. Um, I think basically our attitude was we were going to do everything we can mm -hmm. to win. 
and uh, that meant that we're going to play harder, we're going to get more resources together, we're going to send uh, more contributions than anybody else, and we in fact won. I only lost one time over 10 years, and that's because of the amount of resources I had that tilted the playing field mm -hmm. in a way that frankly made it impossible for people to compete against us. Okay, let's talk about banking, because that's obviously a sector that spends a lot of money, and we've seen the big banks continue to get what they want as far as regulation, as far as uh, impacting the bills, the taxes, the rules. Um, I mean, far beyond the bailouts that we saw in 2008. So I want to talk a little bit about that. You actually brought up in one of your recent pieces, you talked about what uh, the top lobbyist, really, the American Banker Association Executive VP, was talking about uh, launching a fight against Obama's proposed increase to the bank tax. You point out that the banks have been successful in lobbying against taxes like this. It's not just the bailout money in 2008 that they've been successful in kind of having a, a say in. Um, he said they were going to deploy some grassroots pressure it's known as astroturfing. You said, come on, I don't buy that as working. What, how do you think the banks are effective well, in, I, in lobbying and getting their way? Well, I think that one of the things I had, I took issue with what he did was that he's, he's announcing what he's doing in advance. And there's a, <clears throat> there's a certain arrogance there, frankly, that uh, we're going to deploy the grassroots. Uh, that sort of undercuts the whole notion that it's actual grassroots, well, that it's not obviously. bought for and paid. You know, at least yeah. the, the dance should go on or has been going on in Washington for years. Uh, the hip hypocritical dance, uh, so he's actually uh, avoided that whole situation. Well, I that's think... interesting. Do you think that that shows that, that lobbyists feel they can get away with anything? They don't even have to, to kind of give the PR to make it sound like they're not trying these tactics? I think that's definitely the case, uh, and certainly in this case, and I think we find it in other, other areas too. Lobbyists feel all powerful. Lobbyists such as I was really get almost everything they want because you know First of all, you have a team of people, you know the system, you have experts on your staff, as I did, who know every intricate detail. The people you're up against, they don't know what's going on, they don't know the timing, they don't have the inside information that you do in terms of what Congress is doing. You're giving the money, they're not. You're taking them out to play golf, they're not. You're traveling with them, they're not. You're, you're at an immense advantage over the common people and anyone who's frankly doesn't have the resources you do. So then I kind of got us off track because of the, uh, the tangent on his comments. How do you think the banking sector gets their interests advanced? Well, I, I think the banking sector, to the degree that anything proposed is a tax increase, they have a, a built-in advantage in the sense that Republicans are just not in favor of tax increases, and they're not in favor of closing loopholes unless the marginal rate comes down. So anything that's proposed that can be fashioned as a tax increase, there's an immense advantage going in. And uh, we saw that also, by the way, in terms of what, uh, what was going on with the oil companies, the energy companies, with the so-called uh, subsidy that was defeated a few weeks ago. All they needed to do was really say, this is a tax increase. So that's number one. Number two, you're talking about uh, lobbyists that come off Capitol Hill. They are oftentimes members who were on those committees. They not only know every intricate detail, they know all the players who are going to make all the decisions. So they know exactly how to say what they have to say to them to keep the status quo in place. And I think that been immensely effective in that industry, and by the way, many industries, that's what lobbying is, to find somebody who knows the game, knows the players, knows how to, how to work the process, then add to it a little, shake a little money in there, and you have, a, you have a wonderful lobbying cake. When we get back, I want to talk more about that revolving door. We have some good examples. I want to ask you also about the revolving door from Washington, not to K Street, but to Wall Street. So we will have more with Jack Abramoff, author and former lobbyist, in a moment. Still ahead. We will have more with Mr. Abramoff. I want to find out if, hey, maybe money has bought John Corzine the freedom that he's experienced now, if it goes that far. But first, your closing market numbers. Put a picture of me when I was like nine years old on to tell the truth. I have a confession. I am a total ghetto princess. I love rap and hip hop music and Christian music. I thought he was kind of a dick yesterday. I'm very proud of the role that Al Jazeera has played. You know how sometimes you see a story 
and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know. I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. What drives the world? The fear mongering used by politicians. Who makes decisions? Considerable breakthrough has already been made. Who can you trust? No one who is imbued with a global missionary zeal. Where are we heading? State controlled capitalism is called fascism. When nobody dares to ask, we do. RT question more. Welcome back. We're talking to Jack Abramoff, former super lobbyist, about the influence that Wall Street and the financial sector has on the political process. So let's talk about the revolving door because we started uh, before the break. Now, the Center for Responsive Politics reports 1,390 former government workers, employees, work as lobbyists for the financial sector now. That was at the end of 2010. Now, here are some examples. So you have uh, former Congressman Michael Oxley, former chairman of the Financial Services Committee. Now he's a lobbyist. Some of his firm's clients include NASDAQ, Thomson Reuters, uh, Trent Lott, the former Senate Majority Leader. Lobbying firm clients include Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, GE, Raytheon. Another example would be Richard Gephardt, House Majority Leader, formerly. Uh, now the firm that he works for clients include Boeing, Goldman Sachs, GE, Visa. So, Jack Abramoff, when you have these guys, as you kind of started to get into uh, before the break, going from Washington to lobbying for the financial services sector, what exactly does that buy these companies? What do they get with that? It's the it's the connections, you were saying. Yeah, it's the, it's the connections, the access, but it's also the expertise. Uh, they're people of immense influence. The gentlemen that you put up on the screen are obviously incredibly powerful, but there are only three among the many that you mentioned. Yeah. By the way, it's not just, again, this sector. This is happening in every sector. Right. The revolving door spins so quickly in Washington, there's really no way even to, to watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, people dump right out of the Congress and jump right into the lobbying world, the influence world. They often don't call themselves lobbyists, by the way, as we saw with Newt Gingrich calling himself a history professor. Uh, but I think that uh, there's some focus now. Even the American League of Lobbyists is starting to focus on what is the definition of a lobbyist? We have to basically start looking at that because people are sneaking into the lobbying industry, lobbying away, and then just sneaking under the uh, under the uh, radar, and we don't American American people don't actually get to see it. When you said strategic advisor is one that is right. the kind of a code name, you call for ending the revolving door. Right. Is that correct? I do. I do. I'm working with uh, United Republic and some of the other uh, reform groups. We're trying to come up with a formula that would survive constitutionally. I'm not sure a lifetime ban, which is what I advocate, would work, but certainly at least a decade ban. If you are somebody on Capitol Hill, you should not be able to, I'm talking about Congress and the, uh, and the uh, Senate and their staff, and probably apply to the administration as well, you shouldn't be able to go through the door and benefit from the influence industry uh, by influencing people. And I, I think that it's a very dangerous thing for the Republican. Well, you mentioned the staffers. I want to talk about that because you talk about how you used to hire them right. years in advance, right? So that then they feel like they're almost working for you when they're still working for these members. And I mean, just an example that stuck out to me. You have the chair of the Senate Banking Committee who brought on as his staff director a former lobbyist for the American Bankers Association, J.P. Morgan and Freddie Mac. So what is the influence of these staffers? Well, I, I think the staffers, when they come off the Hill, are actually more effective than members. I would actually try never to hire members because they were kind of lazy and they were sort of self-important and felt entitled. Staffers were real razors and killers. They could get things done. They knew exactly where the trains uh, were flying to and put, how to put things on them. and. Uh, Unfortunately, members are generally a little less uh, active, let's just say. So I would only go with staffers. But the other side of the revolving door, going from industry back to Capitol Hill or into the administration, personally, frankly, I think it's fine if one or two, several things. One, that they don't have any big Pa parting package, financial package. Often we'll see them get uh, several million dollars as a little gift on their way out there. They don't have that. And number two, they can't go back. 
Once they make it into the administration, that's it. Now they have to find some place else to, uh, else to work. If that were to happen, frankly, I don't think we'd see any of them doing it. But then your reasoning with the staffers and hiring them early was they felt that they're working for you. So if you're in the administration and you know that when you're done, Goldman Sachs is going to hire you again, aren't you doing their bidding when you're working for the administration? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, they have so-called protections to keep people uh, sequestered from certain issues. But the truth is, they all wind up influencing in some way. There's mm -hmm. some, even if it's not illegal, by the way. And one of the problems in Washington is that the laws are drawn in a way that you can be completely contemptuous within the law. You can be completely Completely corrupt and not get near going over the line. And so, unfortunately, uh, we see these people that get into the administration, they get onto Capitol Hill, or they're getting ready to come back off Capitol Hill, and they are indeed working on behalf of the interests they're eventually going to benefit from. And I want to, along those lines, talk about some of the Washington to Wall Street revolving door uh, movements. There are so many. I mean, we talk about them all the time on this show, but just to give our audience a few, uh, you have Phil Graham, who is the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. He was an outspoken champion of deregulation. Of Okay, he played a role in pushing and writing the repeal of Glass-Steagall, also inserted a provision into the Commodities Futures Modernization Act that exempted over-the-counter derivatives from regulation. We all know who that, how that wound up. Uh, he went on to join UBS as a vice chairman. Another example would be Peter Orzag. He left the Office of Management and Budget to work as a vice chairman for Citigroup. Robert Rubin, former Treasury Secretary, joined Citigroup. Uh, he was chairman of the executive committee of Citigroup's board. Of course, before he was treasurer secretary, he was a top trader and exec at Goldman Sachs. So before you said you don't really disagree with this. Is this okay? Well, I, I, it depends what they do. Mm -hmm. If they're coming out and they're, they have expertise, by the way, as uh, Phil Graham, I think, does. He was, uh, I think, an economics professor. Yeah, maybe Reuben as well. If they have expertise in financial markets and they're working in areas that aren't related to their influence, where they're not going to be spending time using their past connections or trying to help uh, shape the strategies of government affairs for these companies, I don't have a problem with it. But do most of them that don't. Happens? No, I think most of them are very involved in the government affairs strategies because they know it better than anybody in their government affairs department. How, how could they not? Well, that's why they're desirable to a firm like Citigroup Absolutely. or Goldman Sachs, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yes. And I think they have to be, uh, I don't have a problem with somebody going and working for Goldman Sachs if they want to work in the financial sector. But the minute they are back in the government sector, that's where we have a problem. And I think that if they're going to make that jump, they have to be barred from having any influence at all and any contact at all. There has to be an absolute wall set up so they can't be involved in government affairs. Yeah, I don't know how that would be possible. Banks seem really good at finding loopholes, as we've seen with the Volcker rule that they've lobbied so many loopholes for that. I have to ask you, one of when I was doing this research, and this is something that's come up time and time again on this show, uh, is the amount of money... Goldman Sachs employees have spent on on contributions and John Corzine is the number one guy okay nine hundred and sixteen thousand dollars over the years it, it puts them in one of the top spots we know with MF Global his firm imploded and he uh, seemingly stole customer money was the CEO of that firm I have not seen him in cuffs yet do you think there's a case to be made that spending that kind of money in politics can get you a get out of jail free pass? No, I, I think that unless the administration, it's basically going to be the decision of the administration. Uh, the people at the Justice Department, certainly those that worked on my case at the trial attorney and line level, uh, are very honest generally, and they're going to look for the facts and look for the evidence and try to act in that way. However, the political decisions that are made at the sort of top of the Justice Department, sometimes you find, say, in a Republican administration, that they're going to really go after a Republican. I kind of had a little bit of that myself, you know. With the, with the Bush administration, uh, or they make the other decision. The Clinton administration was famous for not going after their people. What the Obama administration will do, we just don't know. I can't imagine for a minute that nobody at the Justice Department is looking into this, uh, even if it's at a very low level. I can't imagine also that somehow uh, former Governor Corzine is in the clear. Uh, I think they're probably going to need to go through all these things. If a crime is committed, they're going to have a very tough time ignoring that. I think the pressure from the Republicans will be immense, and I think the administration doesn't need that headache. So if they do see something there, I would, unfortunately, for Senator Corzine, expect to see some trouble ahead. We'll have to wait and see. I appreciate you for being here. I wish I had more time with you. There's so much to get to, maybe for another day. That was Jack Abramoff, author and former lobbyist.
All right, let's wrap it up with loose change. I've got Dimitri and Shannon to talk about a few uh, loose coins. So have you ever had an interest in being a crook? Well, we have good news for you. There is a YouTube clip detailing how to do just that. Unfortunately, the video also details how you're being robbed every day. Let's see if you notice any similarities. They will all be reduced to impoverished slaves for you to do with as you please, you sadistic, megalomaniacal, sociopathic bastard. So there the narrator was referring to bank loans. So if you want to be the super crook who owns the world, somebody, someone unfortunately already beat you to it. Who is it, Dimitri? The banker, the sadistic, megalomaniacal bastard banker. The Federal Reserve on top of the heap. Right, but the, the banks also create loans out of thin air. They create money out of nothing and they loan it to you. Well, fractional reserve lending. Right, but they don't but even have reserves. That was okay? They don't have reserves, so they have nothing. Well, they do have reserves. But they really don't actually, because there's no reserves in the system. And it doesn't matter, right, because the loan, they'll tell you the loans that make are, become the reserves, but there's no capital in the system and they just create loans and they lend it to you in a sadistic way and then you default and they take your home. And that's pretty much the system. That's why the system eats itself and it destroys the middle class. And all you end up having is these oligarchs sitting on top of this feudal system where everyone is working for nothing and the whole system is just collapsed. And you end up having these robber hoods out in the jungle and in the forest shooting people with arrows and gangs and stuff like that. That's the world we're heading into. That's what Hunger Games is all about. People should watch uh, Hunger Games. I've seen it. I think it's very what, accurate. What are you, an advertiser? Are you promoting them there? Let's move yeah, on to the I next program. Enough of that. Okay. With the space shuttle program ending last year, NASA needed a new way to get its astronauts into space. Enter Sir Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic. We have a great relationship with NASA. Uh, I think the staff are really pleased at NASA to see uh, that, you know, like, that space travel will continue uh, with Virgin Galactic over the next five or six years while NASA get, uh, you know, build their new vehicles. We'll move over, Branson, because a shift in policy could open up space to ownership by private companies. A space policy consultant is shopping around a bill in the Capitol allowing property rights for private companies who seek to develop space resources and infrastructure because the 1967 Outer Space Treaty prohibits sovereign nations from owning a celestial body that has been signed by 100 countries including the U.S. but there's a loophole in the treaty that does not explicitly prohibit ownership of space resources by private enterprises. Of course, the U.S. is taking an imperial mission to, to outer space, saying, hey, we can make this private property for you uh, powerful investors well, listen, and corporations. I think it, well, right. So, I mean, I think the key here is, is can we get the small businessman into space? I think that should be the key. The entrepreneur should be out there and trying to mine some, uh, some moon rock fields and stuff like that and get things going. I'm pretty sure the barriers to entry are pretty, pretty high. high on getting your hands on a spaceship and <laughs> training to be an astronaut and everything that entails to me well, I'm right. not so sure that, that, that that's you're right point. but the the whole point of entrepreneur uh, of entrepreneurialism and capitalism is you want to drop those barriers and you want to get those young entrepreneurs that are now in Silicon Valley you want to get them into spaceships and spacesuits and off into space mining some space rocks and making some stuff happen in space that's what I like to see <laughs> that's what I'm all about I don't know what happens when the aliens come and dispute your property rights Shannon I'm not sure about that, but the PR campaign in order to get someone to go and be entrepreneurial in Uranus is going to be oh. pretty high. In Uranus? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, good thing that the we're out of time, so we can't hear Dimitri's response. That's all we have time for. <laughs> Thanks for Uranus. tuning in. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Lauren Lister. Give us feedback on the show at youtube.com slash capital account. Thanks for watching and have a great night.